welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm Kellen Betts, a course lead in the MITx MicroMasters program in supply chain management here at MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. I'm honored today to be co-hosting with Laura Alea, also a co also a co uh, also excuse me also a course lead in the MicroMasters program. And today we're very excited to have Harris Chalat join us. Harris, welcome. Welcome, Kellen. Excited to be here. Thank you. Awesome. So thank you for joining us today and thank you for our audience for joining us today as well. And so if we can maybe um, launch our first poll, if those who attended our webinars before, we'd like to start things off with a poll, just to kind of query what um, brought you here today, what you're interested in learning about today. So the question, why are you here today? A few of the options to better understand how technology can help you achieve sustainability goals. I'm into technology and any new perspective is interesting to me. Hopefully we have some MicroMasters learners out here who don't miss any of our live events. We'd love to see you and have you join us here as well. And while we um, give you a few minutes or a minute or so there to, to take a look at that poll, Laura, we'll go through our agenda for today. Awesome. Thank you, Kellen, and welcome, everyone. So during the next 10 to 15 minutes, Harris will discuss the challenges that all companies face with emissions data in their supply chains. And of course, we're also here to discuss how technology helps companies understand the role they play, the impact they have, and to design better supply chains. Kellen and I will then ask some questions we have prepared for Harris, and we will always save time for a Q&A at the very end for your questions. So start thinking of those. And remember that we use the Q&A feature to ask the questions. So don't put the questions in the chat, just use the Q&A feature. Of course, be sure to be logged in with a name because we don't read anonymous questions. So we appreciate that. And before going to Harris, let's just end this poll and share the results. I'm curious if we have more people into technology, into sustainability, or into the combination of both. So the great thing is that almost 70% of you are here for both technology, helping achieve sustainability goals, which is amazing. And also 61% uh, of you answer about learning more about sustainable supply chains. So how do you feel about that, Harris? Are you ready to kick it off considering this poll results? Yeah, I'm excited. I think today will be a fun discussion. Awesome. So the floor is, is yours. Okay, excellent. I'll pull up my presentation. Love to see our 50% of audience out there who are MicroMasters learners who don't miss any of our events. Thank you for joining us again today. Hopefully you're enjoying the courses. And thanks everyone who is saying hi in the chat. We are always excited to see some names we, we, we've known from the courses joining us today. Okay, All right. there we go. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, appreciate coming more for the introduction. Uh, again, my name is Harris Schlott. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Mir AI. Um, and, and we're going to spend today talking a little bit about how we see technology being able to help build more sustainable global supply chains. Uh, really quickly, uh, Kelvin Moore asked that I gave a little bit of background on myself and how I ended up to where I am today at Mir. So I, I wanted to give that to the group. Uh, definitely a little bit of a unique uh, story into sustainability. I went to undergraduate school at MIT, um, studied course 16 for everyone that's familiar with the, the MIT language, which is aerospace engineering. Uh, it, one of the more unique aspects of my co-founder stories, I actually played football with my now co-founder, Peter Williams. There's a nice action shot of us playing together back in the day. Uh, definitely think there's some unique bonds that were built during the college time with me and him that helped us now build a successful company. After school, I went and spent the majority of my career in the aerospace industry, um, largely at SpaceX, where I was focused on a, a mixture of engineering, program management, and business development. Uh, largely for some unique remote sensing and satellite technology that we were building. Uh, there's a nice shot of a Falcon 9 rocket that we were helping roll out to the launch pad um, back in the day, just to give you some appreciation of like, the immensity of the platforms we were working on. I loved working in space. It's a very exciting field. Uh, getting humans to Mars is, is you know, a very cool thing to, to want to go build towards, but fundamentally I just didn't feel like that was the biggest problem that we had as a society or where we should focus and really wanted to find opportunities to go apply myself in climate. Um, it was about this time that me and Peter came back together and, and agreed that the best way to do that was to find ways within technology and, and the new company to go and solve challenges that we saw. 
Um, and that's what led to us founding NIR in 2022. Uh, NIR is a seed stage climate tech company based out of Seattle. And, and our focus is on leveraging artificial intelligence to help corporations both reduce cost and emissions within their global supply chains. So clearly the jump from aerospace engineering to uh, carbon emissions and global supply chains is unique. Um, how did we end up here? Uh, I think that's a completely fair question. And, and the answer is there's a significant opportunity to reduce emissions at a gigaton scale in a very near time frame by going and addressing the challenges that we're seeing in the global supply chains. So I think most people on this call probably appreciate that global supply chains are large, complex networks. And, and when we're talking about the supply chains, we're not just talking about the, the transportation of goods, but the full value chain of uh, processing, manufacturing, and building goods across uh, the, the world to then develop an end product that a, a company is purchasing. And to give you this, I understand the size of the sustainability impact that supply chains have for corporations. I pulled really quickly a few different corporations' uh, uh, sustainability reports across a few different industries. You know, we have General Motors. When, when you think of cars, you typically think of the emissions associated with driving the car. But the building of those cars is a significant portion of the overall carbon footprint. Uh, you know, 50 megatons or, or one fifth of GM's overall carbon footprint is from the manufacture of the cars. So it's on par with the emissions associated with driving the cars is, is just building them. Um, if you go to the electronic space, we have Apple here as an example, it, that percentage increases significantly to 74% or 15 megatons. And then if you move into the more consumer goods space, it, it typically is even higher at 85% for Johnson & Johnson here as a representation. These are huge numbers. And maybe uh, unsurprisingly with these huge numbers in terms of overall footprint, there's also lots of opportunities to reduce their emissions. Amir, the way, the way that we typically think about these reductions are in a few different buckets. The first is sourcing decisions. You know, where am I buying my goods from? Who's that person that I bought from? Where are they based in the world? The material selections. So what are those goods going into my product? Is it metal? Is it plastic? Is it recycled? Is it virgin? Um, and then what are those efficiency and uh, energy investments that we can take to go reduce emissions? You know, this, this is where renewable energies come in or efficiency investments to make up processes more green. Um, and those are the, the unique broad buckets that we, we talk about when we talk about reductions, but there's lots of specific attributes that you can go take to reduce emissions for manufacturing to give a good. And, and those different reduction opportunities when compounded together provide a significant opportunity to reduce overall carbon emissions. So these opportunities exist, but we're not really seeing companies being able to go in and execute on them. And, and, and that leads to ask, why is that? Um, the, the simple answer is, is that Global supply chains are incredibly complex, opaque networks. You know, we, we have visual representation here of a Fortune 1000 corporations. This is one of their business units supply chain to tier three. And you can just see how quickly these networks become tens of thousands of interactions between different companies that the, the thought of trying to keep track of it becomes very challenging. And, and because corporations only have this partial insight of what's happening within their supply chains, they really lack the ability to understand and identify those key reduction opportunities within their supply chain. Um, when we're talking about what are the emissions associated with a given good, there's typically three questions that we like to think about. It's where in the world did this process happen? What went into the product? What were those materials consumed? And how is the product built? And if you can answer those three questions from the you know, delivered end good back to raw material, you will have a pretty strong understanding of what your emissions for that given product are. Corporations are trying to get an appreciation of answering those questions to date uh, via supplier surveys. So that's you know a company going out to their suppliers and asking them to provide some detailed information about how they manufacture the goods, asking them to ask those same questions to their suppliers. And, and that sounds simple enough, right? But it, in actuality, when you're talking about tens of thousands of suppliers that may be disincentivized to provide you truthful, clear answers, what we're seeing is a significant amount of time invested by corporations to go and try to gather this type of data and being left with only partial and incomplete insights in terms of what's actually happening. Um, BCG ran a recent survey that they do this annually. In 2022, they found that 90% of respondents felt that they did not have a comprehensive understanding of their emissions. So global supply chains, we know are a huge portion of corporations overall carbon footprint, but because of the complexities that are associated with global supply chain, 
is really an ability to understand how can I go and actually manage and reduce those emissions. And that's where we at MIR see an opportunity for technology to come in and help address these challenges. Um, specifically at MIR, what we're focused on is, is leveraging artificial intelligence combined with large public and proprietary data sets um, to be able to provide actionable insights for companies to go reduce those emissions at scale. Um, and, and what that means is technology stepping in to help assist these procurement supply chain teams by requiring minimal amount of customer inputs to be able to provide answers to being able to do something quickly, autonomously, and at the quantity of hundreds of thousands, being able to answer those key questions that I talked about earlier, the, the where did this good probably come from? What went into it? How was it made? And doing so at a granularity and with the understanding of drivers and benchmarks to be able to then say, okay, now that we understand the where, what, and how, how can I then reduce my emissions? And, and that's specifically where we're focused on mirrors, is taking this type of technology capability assessing against hundreds of thousands of different products for corporations, being able to benchmark and understand how that corporation is performing against their peers. Uh, and then from there, being able to map out different scenarios and identifying peer reduction plans for customers. And then a unique aspect of what we're focused on is also helping companies understand what are these impacts uh, from reduction strategies on a pricing perspective. Um, the way that we like to think of finding best reduction opportunities is by finding what we like to call win-win opportunities. These are ways that you help corporations find um, a decision point that both lowers emissions as well as the cost of goods sold. And, and clearly, if you are able to identify those types of opportunities, companies, it's a no brainer for them. They'll, they'll go take those every day. And, and so that's where we really see the opportunity for technology to go have a fundamental impact on global supply chain stays by answering these questions and, and from there driving them to here are the answers of how we can go manage the emissions for your supply chain, given the complexities that exist in today's world. Um, I'll, I'll pause there. Kel and Laura, I think we'll probably shift over to questions now. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Harris. I definitely appreciate the the background there and the your presentation and a little describing a little bit how you're approaching this problem. It definitely, it seems like a challenging problem. You know, I love that diagram. You have that network diagram. It really shows the complexity of of like even just a tier three supply chain. Like even trying to to visualize that is is difficult. You know, it's really hard to see all those relationships. You know, so many. Yeah. And then you also have the scale of, of the number of products. You know, so you're talking about hundreds of thousands of products. Someone who's done those calculations, like for a single product, I can't imagine scaling that to hundreds of products, even hundreds of thousands of products. Um, so maybe I want to kind of start like with the first question here, kind of focusing in on the technology side of things and. You know how AI is coming to this. I know AI is a hot topic in the news, certainly with like ChatGPT and some of these tools out there on the consumer side and you know chatbots, but it's also being leveraged in a lot of other ways. Um, so I wonder if you can maybe elaborate a little bit further on how AI and machine learning comes into this this play and how you're leveraging that to scale some of these calculations um, across the the tiers as well as the number of products. Yeah, yeah. So for us, when we talk about our data system and how we're providing these answers to customers. It's through this unique pipeline that we like to talk about, you know, answering first, what went into your product? Um, where did it come from? And then how do we think it happened, right? Those same three questions. And so what we found is that there's unique steps and algorithms and processes that can be applied to each one of those questions to then help provide a comprehensive answer. Um, so part of it's being able to, you know, leverage machine learning to understand natural language. So, you know, I'm looking at a cotton t-shirt versus an athletic t-shirt. And then from there, understanding what went into that material. So that's like one unique application of machine learning that we, we've leveraged. Um, another is being able to understand what the given products likely alternative materials or reduction opportunities are. Um, and that's something where we have large proprietary databases that to be able to sift through, it's helpful to have our traditional intelligence. Um, and then there's the communication of where do we see the reduction opportunities? And, and that's where you can then start to get into some interest in like human interfacing aspects where something like an LLM can be really helpful to help communicate insights. It, it's not just artificial intelligence, however, that there are like more standard data science applications that we also leverage. So like from when it comes to like trade modeling, we typically fall back to like a more stochastic probability view. And so it, it's for us, this unique system of combining all these different applications and technologies from the data science world with the insights and capabilities to answer each of those questions along the pipeline for a given good. And so it's a, it's a complex multitude system, which is why we like to call it data fusion. Awesome. And, and as I hear you, I can't think of 
how many more layers of complexity are out there in this decision making process and, and that you are supporting through technology that we may be missing when we make our decisions. Now I'm thinking on the huge level of granularity in your information and, and you also mentioned that in your in your slides. Um, but to identify a little piece within some product or a raw material coming from somewhere else in the world and every piece of information that it generated throughout the supply chain. I'm wondering how do you decide, how, how do you feel your model? You talk about um, public sources, you also talk about company provided information, but I'm thinking of data sources, different languages, different structures, different pieces of information, probably different metric systems. So how do you manage to feed um, your, your uh, tools? to include all those and how do you provide a good level of accuracy considering all those assumptions you may make in the process? Yeah, <clears throat> so for the first question, generally how we like to approach this is by asking for as little as possible from customers, at least from the start. Clearly as you get more mature and sophisticated with like sustainability, you'll have more insights. But by saying in the beginning process and steps with the customer. All we want to know is what products did you buy and who did you buy them from? Those simple inputs. We can then leverage our, our systems to provide you value. It allows us to simplify the data gathering and, and delivery to us. So not having to have complex multi-language inputs from like different suppliers across the world, uh, building materials like these more um, bespoke data wells. Uh, aren't required for us to provide you initial service. And so that, that's a key aspect of how we are able to like simplify this process for the customers. As we get more sophisticated and start to look at things like billing materials or supplier traceability insights or surveys, um, that's where like being able to leverage an, an API integration, which is part of our service capability, it makes it a little bit cleaner and easier to just have something that if you integrate into this, it'll be fully autonomous. You don't have to worry about it again and it, and it will feed into the system to give you insights. And so finding ways to help reduce the friction of those data gathering efforts and data processing efforts is clearly an important step to help companies not have friction when trying to go and understand what their sustainability management is. Um, in terms of the accuracy perspective, um, for us, it, it's uh, a little bit of twofold. First is like making sure we have a really strong, accurate understanding of the emissions for a given good. Um, we, we've gone and gone in our system, verified against industry standards. So there's ISO standards like 14067 that third parties have verified our system against. We also take like a little bit of a data science role where we have a large database of proprietary life cycle assessments, sort of the ground truth of what the emissions of the good are. And we run our model against those large databases to continue to have confidence as we are improving, tinkering, improving the system to make sure that it, it still hits the accuracy numbers we want to hit. And, and then the second part of this is you have to look at the alter alternative, right? We'll never say that like artificial intelligence will give you pure golden truth understanding what's happening within the supply chain, but it is very accurate. And when you start to look at that compared to the other solutions on the market, which are typically falling back to things like industry averages for the emissions of a t-shirt, let's say, you start to see like significant higher uncertainty and accuracy of those types of solutions and what you do have with a, a solution that we see with Mir. And, and so, that's how we kind of think about the accuracy discussion and talk about it with customers. Awesome, thank you. And definitely, you know, it sounds like a challenging um, problem and, and bringing a lot of things together and makes sense to try to benchmark that with some of those databases as well. And I also see there's some um, questions there in the Q&A, so thank you for bringing those and keep bringing those. We'll definitely have some time at the end here to, to bring your questions. We appreciate um, your input um, to this live event as well. So one thing I wanna kind of dive in maybe a little bit more is kind of how you see data systems evolving with this, right? And so you're talking about like a lot of external data sources and where maybe like the question would be, where are these external data sources coming from and how are you kind of bringing these together? You know, are you bringing these together in a cloud platform? Um, and what is that kind of data, you, you talk about data fusion, but what is like that data platform, if you will, look like? Yeah, so for us, it's, it's being able to take data insights that may not be valuable on their own and combining them together then to provide a process for customers that is valuable. Um, and so for us, what we're developing is this platform that customers can come on and from there be able to very easily, again, with like minimal input on their end, start to understand how can I reduce my emissions? Where are those opportunities within my system? And so it's being able to see dynamically both like that top line, here's where we think you should focus to reduce your emissions. But how did we get there? Where do we think your goods are coming from? Like, 
if we're talking about this comp t-shirt, where do we think the comp fabric is coming from? Where do we think the like the processes are associated with it? And then being able to allow customers to say, actually, you know what? I know my cotton's coming from this country versus this one. And being able to be iterative and gather then your bespoke nuance insights that you do have within the system to, to grow and morph into what's the most representative model of, of your actual supply chain. And so it's being able to provide that platform that gives that top line understanding recommendation, but also a little bit of that story of how we got there. And then like a, a checkpoint to make sure that what we think happened is, is actual. And so that, that's that's where we're providing customers value within our platform and our system. I'm trying to think now on the more on the business per perspective and also into the change in the mindset. So I'm taking a little bit uh, out of the technology now for for discussing something different. So we are used to, just as an example, we're used to supplier collaboration. We train ourselves to work on supplier collaboration if we're talking about strategic suppliers, strategic, strategic products or anything like that. But you are bringing the possibility with use the use of technology of kind of not needing that survey or that conversation with the supplier to gather all the information that could make us um, make better decision in terms of sustainability. So the question is, do you see AI replacing the way we do things? Do you see it enhancing? There, there's all this conversation about AI yeah. replacing us or replacing our interactions. I'm wondering, based on your experience, what is it that you see for the future of, of this? I I don't think that it's replacing anybody. I don't think it's replacing like the relationships built via, via supplier engagement. What I do see is the opportunity that is significant is enhancing the capabilities of supply chain teams to engage with their supply chains, understand how they should be engaged with their supply chains and, and empower them in those engagements. So being able to understand which suppliers actually worth your time to go and engage from an emissions perspective, because they're the ones that have a large portion of your footprint and also are doing poorly. And then being able to understand how we can in our next supplier negotiations, leverage new data sets and insights to make them more sustainable. Being able to have those types of like new insights across tens of thousands of goods and not having to try to rely on data gathering, data cleaning steps, but instead, how do I go and do what we should all be focused on as supply chain professionals, which is manage my supply chain to make it the better supply chain that I want to see it to be, um, is how we think about it. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, and then thank you also for all the questions in the Q&A. We'll definitely save some time here for, for the Q&A. And so I'm going to kind of maybe shift gears and ask one last question, and then we'll bring some questions here um, from our audience. But you know, I know a lot of our audience are in maybe a point of career transition or they're, or they're learning and they're in a learning journey within our courses or they're just joining us here to learn more about this particular topic today. And you mentioned how you started your journey in aeronautics and engineering and then kind of found your passion and sustainability and kind of shifted focus to climate technology as well. So I wonder if you have any advice maybe for our MicroMasters learners or others who are here in the audience today on kind of what they could do to maybe, you know, orient their career in this way if they have that particular passion or if they just find themselves in that kind of similar transition going from, you know, one space where they have a, a, a tool set and how they can apply it to a particular passion they might find themselves with. Yeah, I, I think this is a great question. Um, I think... For many professionals, like what, what I habitually tell people is you don't need to have sustainability in your title to, to go have impact within the company. Um, very often it's people that are not sustainability professionals that are the ones being able to identify and drive decisions that also have positive impact on reducing carbon emissions. And so what, what I would say is if you're interested in sustainability, if it matters to you is find those opportunities within your day-to-day -day operations within a company to go make those improvements. And, and clearly like for us, like we think that supply chains are a huge opportunity there. And so uh, for a lot of the students on this call, I, I think thinking about how do I manage these potential supplier engagements, the development and sourcing decisions in the future to also fold in and incorporate sustainability aspects is a significant way for you to begin to drive towards a better world, but also build out a deeper understanding and, and fundamental experience of what it means to be a, a sustainable professional that can continue to build your career and, and be part of your journey as you grow. Awesome, thank you for sharing that. We get that question a lot. Like there's a lot of people trying to switch gears into sustainability or into supply chain or 
combining both. And, and the question is, is it already too late for me? Uh, so thank you for sharing your experience. I think it's adding a lot of value to our audience. So bring yeah, in some uh, questions. Oh, go ahead. I, go I ahead. was just gonna say, Laura, like, it's definitely not too late. Uh, we need more and more people, both, uh, you know, directly involved in sustainability, but just in the wider uh, corporate world, focus on sustainability. And those are the people that really drive change. So absolutely, it's not too late. This is the time to do it. We need more people focused on this challenge. Awesome. Great call to identify more game changers that are joining us in this quest. So that's great. Um, I was just thinking on a question on the uh, Q&A feature. Uh, it's from Sai. So this is probably bringing us a little bit more into the technology again, and probably for those that are not that familiar with AI or its capabilities, um, they are asking if you could please elaborate why using AI, why that technology specifically out of all the possibilities that you have and out of the existing tool that we already have to calculate emissions and try to identify hotspots? Yeah, so the, the key capability of artificial intelligence is to help provide more signal within a very noisy environment. That's one of the ways I'd like to like think about what is the value of artificial intelligence. Um, when we talk about understanding the carbon footprint of a given product and opportunities for reductions, for a singular product, uh, it can be pretty easy to like build this story over a couple months and, and appreciate what the emissions are. Um, but if you look at how do I handle this across a global supply chain when I'm a corporation that maybe has thousands or tens of thousands of products, uh, tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of suppliers, it becomes very, very challenging to look across that entire field and understand not only just like what is my carbon footprint, like co companies can today get a relatively good understanding of the scope of their emissions, they can incorporate the sustainability reports, they'll meet regulatory requirements, but more specifically, how do I actually go and reduce these emissions and do it in a strategic cost-effective manner? That becomes a very complicated and nuanced assessment where you need to be able to appreciate all these different factors from, you know, global grid performances to trade behavior to manufacturing processing differences to then be able to say, this is where we actually think that the opportunities are. And, and you need to be able to do that fast and you need to be able to do it at scale. And, and that's where we see artificial intelligence coming in and providing a technology unlock to, to solve that answer. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. It definitely makes sense, the scale. You know, again, just going back to that network diagram you described, you know, the complexity there in terms of the tiers of a supply chain, but also the complexity in terms of the number of products, especially if you're doing something at a at a granular level like you're you're doing. Um, I want to kind of maybe build on that a little bit. And earlier you mentioned how you do some benchmarking with some standards. And there's a question here from Leo. Um, and he's, his question is kind of, you know, specifically about are you using a specific standard, but I want to maybe generalize it a little bit. And I know this kind of, you know, carbon calculation is a little bit early days to a certain degree. You know, there's a lot of different companies and a lot of different you know, researchers approaching those these problems in different ways. And there's, I think, the number of different standards and organizations out there putting standards out there. So I'm wondering maybe if you could talk about maybe your approach to how you're thinking about this space, like what standards should you know, could be utilized, how you compare different standards against each other, and then how you're using those to benchmark your particular methods. Yeah. Uh, what I'll say is that, like, standards for carbon accounting are, are very mature for scope one and scope two. And we, did, and we didn't get into the scopes too much um, and those types of definitions, but scope one and scope two are the more your direct emissions for your facility, as well as the indirect emissions associated with things like your electricity consumption for your your facility. So it's, it's the things that typically like a utilities bill can really help you have a strong understanding of it. And there's well-documented consistent ways across industries to report those emissions. Scope three, where the supply chain emissions lie, um, you'll see in some of the kind of general standards like the greenhouse gas protocol, it becomes a little bit more ambiguous and, and there's a little bit less certainty, especially on the global supply chain side, where you know there's this acknowledgement that if you can get ground truth primary data from suppliers, that's the best. But in the absence of that, which is very typically the environment that companies find themselves in, it's, it's very challenging and, and there's a little bit of ambiguity in terms of how you solve that. Um, specific to what we're focused on, which is what is the emissions of a given product? There are ISO standards. So ISO 14067 is the sort of baseline standard of how you try to go make that assessment for a given good. That's the methodology that we've gone and gotten ourselves verified against because that's seen as the ground truth that then is applicable to things like the GHG protocol, as well as other regulatory standards that we're seeing come online, both from the EU and California. Um, so 
because of sort of the acknowledgement that there's a little bit of ambiguity here, but the best that we have is ISO 14067 for a product carbon footprint. That's the one that we've relied on today. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. It's great to see how things are actually done and not just what we read about all the available options and standards. So it's great to, to take it down to earth with your experience. Um, I want to bring a couple of questions probably merged together from Annalise in our audience and also Pin Swang. Um, so the, the questions they are bringing is that there are a lot of specifics detail within you know, and across industries in, without even considering the global and cultural impacts. Um, how do you manage to build some some tools that work across industries? Or is it that you need to fine tune it or, or tailor it every time you work on a different one? Yeah, that's that's a great question. For us, we've been really focused on how can we make this a ambiguous model system? Part of it is because when you look at a large Fortune 500 corporation supply chain, like you're that company may be buying one specific good, like a, an Apple is buying their, their manufactured phones, but they're also purchasing a lot of different items to be able to manufacture that good. And so there becomes sort of like cross industry procurements that you have to like worry about and consider. So even if you're talking about a company that is in a specific industry, their, their supply chain probably crosses over into different industries as well. So there's this like weird application where you talk about a company supply chain and it starts to become almost every industry. Um, I will say that like we are focused um, at Mir at a few more specific customers and industry types being the manufacturing uh, consumer good fields where these types of companies have large complex global supply chains. And there's real challenges understanding what the manufacturing processes and emissions associated with them are. There are some industries that um, are more nuanced and verticalized like agriculture is one um, where clearly uh, there are distinct challenges with trying to appreciate the emissions associated with cattle or, or rice um, that are nuanced and different. And, and that's been a field that we were invested less in, frankly. Um, and there is a little bit of more verticalization um, to go and service those players. Awesome. Thank you for that. It makes me think of like how I've seen a diagram you know, one time where it's almost like the, the hat is on both sides, you know, where, you know, it goes to your, your, Quite your comment there about how there's kind of some cross pollination or you know cross industries where you know ultimately everything comes from the earth right the raw materials come from the earth and so there's kind of the the narrow funnel on one side and then it goes this really complex web of supply chain network in the middle and then it maybe goes yeah. to then that that single brand or whatever happens to be at the peak on the other side um, it's kind of you know building on your thing your uh, comment there but I want to also combine a couple of questions here from our audience as well um, and shift gears a little bit just in terms of like the the perception or the the sensitivity around you know some of these calculations so I, like supply chain data and sharing you know data across supply chain partners has always been kind of a it's a kind of a classic problem with supply chain if you will and there's always been you know disincentives and reasons why companies want to keep their information proprietary and those kinds of things and i'm wondering how you're you're thinking about this problem you know, from the sustainability perspective and how, you know, you're, you approach those conversations of, you know, how you share data and how you protect data and, and, and how this information is then also communicated outside of your particular platform. Like, what is the, what is the kind of the conversation around that? Yeah. So I, I think it's clear that a large motivation for us at Mir is to be able to help companies manage and address their sustainability needs while not being reliant on some of those data sharing challenges like that that for us is one of the big unlocks that we're focused on um however gathering data and helping promote those data sharing aspects is part of what we encourage and like to see because it gives you more accurate data and more nuanced assessment you do need to as you're going and taking in primary reported data from a supplier need to recognize that things like how much of a given production line is dedicated to a given customer where are you sourcing your goods from? What are the materials that are going into it? Are very sensitive trade secret pieces of data to that given supplier. And so having proper data security, making sure there's not leakages across companies, being able to be a, a trusted third party in this interaction of, of proprietary data sharing is part of where we see ourselves as a mirror. So it, it's, it can't be a thing where you're taking this trade secret information from a given supplier and then providing it to whoever may be interested. For us, it, it, you have to keep that secure. You have to keep it locked away. 
um, in a manner that may, maybe allows you to give higher value output to the customers that are interested, but does not harm that trust that you're building with suppliers. Right. I'm bringing here Pedro, who is having another question. You mentioned about the trade-off between the cost and the emissions, emissions generated and that being a driver of decision-making, like low-hanging fruits kind of uh, where to start. Mm -hmm. um, Pedro is wondering if you're considering this financial aspect, how is it that you measure? How do you incorporate that trade-off with cost? Is it that companies are willing to open that? Is it that you have this as part of the common data set in terms of what's probably going to happen? Yeah, so I, I think maybe just to make sure that I answer the question, because I, I, th I think there's kind of two here. Um, first off, at Mirror, what, what we're doing is we're helping companies understand the cost of the raw materials going into their good. So it's along with the carbon, another part of our, our product is this capability to understand, I purchased this good from this given supplier, what should the raw material cost be? What are they? And what is then that like opportunity to make more strategic decision-making um, off of that? Um, and then at the end of the day, it's providing corporations understanding of these impacts, both cost and, and uh, sustainability for them to go make decisions off of. You know, there's corporations that have a distinct price point for carbon within their own, own internal systems. Like they'll say that carbon is worth $60 per metric ton of CO2. Um, that's not extremely common, although I have seen and talked to companies that do that. But there always seems to be some sort of undefined price point where the reduction of CO2, and it could vary a lot, right? Like there's probably companies out there that value it at like a cent a ton. Um, and I think a lot of them value maybe lower the market price, but at some significant value where there is a point where the price becomes worth the reduction of CO2. Um, and, and trying to understand that and appreciate that so that then companies can consume and, and make decisions that then seem obvious based off of their thought process is, is challenging, but it's part of the process of what we've been developing and trying to deliver to customers via our platform. Awesome, thank you. Um, I want to build on a question here from um, Ninad, and I hopefully I'm pronouncing your name your name correctly there. But his question is on track and trace. And I want to kind of pick up on something you said earlier. You mentioned earlier about how a lot of you know the maybe the greenhouse gas protocol and some of the other um, you know standards, if you will, say that the the golden standard is that you know source of truth that data that real supply chain data, and that's what you're always looking for. And I'm wondering if you've like where the state of the industry is in terms of I'm getting more of that. Like, are there any new technologies out there? Like track and trace kind of comes to mind of how we're, you know, tracking a unique serialized product, if you will, through the supply chain. That's always been a significant challenge and there's lots of kind of technology and other hurdles. And But kind of where is the state of the art and where do you see that industry going just in terms of getting sustainability related data, but from a track and trace perspective? Yeah, traceability, there's a lot of companies and effort going on to like, how do we build passports for goods? So there's a lot of companies trying to figure out how do you get ground truth of that. Um, and then I, I think the more challenging question is, is earnestly the, the, uh, the tracking of the processes and, and what are the emissions for a given facility or factory? How do you contribute those? Uh, there's aspects here where you're trying to reduce friction, whether it's like by being able to incorporate utility bills, which like Arcadia, if you're familiar with that company, is doing at a global level. Um, or with the large carbon accounting ERP platforms where you're streamlining the, the supplier request forms. Um, a lot of that technology focus today is on reducing friction to allow suppliers more easily engage with their, um, their customers. I think the bigger challenge and hurdle is really education for the wider supply chain, being able to help, help in a, a, a manner that can do so at, at scale of what does it mean to go report your own scope one and scope two emissions? How do you handle that reporting? Um, and, and I think that's one that still needs a little bit of thought in terms of how can we do this and how can technology help us do this at a, a larger scale than what we're doing today? Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, and the fact that I think it's probably a mindset change. We need to understand the impact we have in the sustainability kind of practices in the carbon emissions factors. Um, so I have another question that probably is also talking about the scale and you're talking about 
probably huge companies and you're talking about global supply chains, but there's also smaller scale kind of companies. Um, how do you assess how ready a company is to implement this kind of technology? Of course, you're kind of bringing the technology to them. So probably they don't have to build all the infrastructure and that's a huge help. But in terms of available data, in terms of decision-making capabilities, how do you see them yeah. being ready or not to move on with that? Yeah, so you know, I think sustainability is a journey and, and corporations are on a pretty wide variance of where they are on that journey. For us, we generally try to go and service companies that are starting that journey. Um, typically what we're seeing, especially in like the mid-market space is these are the companies that all of a sudden are servicing, you know, like the General Motors or the, the Apple or the Johnson & Johnson that I brought up earlier in the presentation being told, hey, we now have requirements for you to sign up and commit to for reductions because we as GM, Apple, Johnson Johnson have made commitments ourselves to reduce our scope three emissions. But these mid-market players are not the same as, as an Apple where they don't have that huge sustainability and supply chain team that could go manage, engage, and, and you know, be involved for every single product material selection and, and really try to... Uh, use their resources to, to have impact. Instead, like those are the types of players in the mid market where we see like a great opportunity for technology to come and step in, take a smaller supply chain team and, and make them more effective and impactful given you know what may be a more re resource limited environment. And, and that's who we really think is like can benefit the most from us, especially to date, um, where we can go and give you answers immediately. And then as you grow and as you start to advance along your sustainability journey, we can help grow with you and give you those nuanced insights and representation as you start to get better supplier data, as you start to implement reduction strategies, as you start to model out these implications. For us, that's um, that's where we see the, the real value. If you're, um, yeah. Awesome, yeah, thank you. It definitely makes sense to help um, companies who maybe don't have this expertise or maybe just have a small sustainability team, or maybe it's you know a cross-disciplinary um, scenario yeah. where it's a supply chain practitioner or someone you know working in a warehouse, but giving them empowering them with tools to help you know them make an impact. Um, that's awesome. So I want to build on one one question, but maybe before we jump into the next question, if we could launch our final poll here and just kind of we like to always wrap things up with a poll here and just get a sense of what you got out of today's presentation and discussion. Um, so the question here: What was the most interesting part of today's session for you? You know, a couple of options there: learning how to increase efficiency through innovation in supply chain. So if you could just um, take a moment to look at that poll. And then while you while you do, I want to, again, build on a question here, also kind of building on a little bit earlier our discussion on the, the standards, um, but maybe expanding that on, you know, to your recent comments about how companies are maybe voluntarily doing this. But I know there's also some regulatory component to this to a certain degree. You know, like, for example, in the U.S. here, the SEC recently has has some new requirements. I think they're on hold now because of a, a court case. In the EU, there's the carbon border tax and there's a number of different regulations coming in the EU as well. And so I'm wondering how regulation is coming into this and just in terms of the incentives, but then also the kind of the, how that's gonna help expand the scope of companies getting involved in these calculations. Yeah, I, I, we like to think of regulations as like a, a tailwind for us. Um, we are very much focused on like, how do we help comfort companies um, manage their supply chains, reduce emissions, reduce cost, and have that as our focused business proposition. The regulations are clearly a, a strong catalyst for companies to care about sustainability. Um, in terms of the regulation sphere that's out there, you know, like California's uh, emissions reporting, SEC are, are occurring, and like there's discussions, SEC's like clearly got a little bit um, hamstrung in terms of what the, the scale of was, that scope three emissions are not part of that. And now there's like, you know, will it actually come into place is another question. But the one that I think is the most relevant and most impactful regulation going forward, and you kind of alluded to it, Kellen, is the carbon border adjustment mechanism um, in the EU or CBAM as it's called. This is the first international tax associated with goods imported to the EU for a few specific industries that are, that are having many industries to start with like steel and aluminum and fertilizer. Um, but it's the first time that we've seen a regulatory body actually put a dollar sign against CO2 emissions. And I, I think that that we've seen be a really big fundamental shift in perspective. Um, I think that it's been a big driver in the like last year or two years for a few specific industries like the automotive industry um, to take more sincere financial commitments and like 
I, I mentioned it earlier, like the internal dollar per, per CO2 perspective, I think it's made it a little bit more real. Like it, it's helped define that this will be, if you are doing business in the EU or you're buying goods from the EU, an actual dollar per CO2 that you need to consider. And so I think it's one of those things that helps companies become more firm on the financial impact of their CO2 emissions. And, and I think it's going to be one of those drivers that we'll see over the next few years really have an impact. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that. And, and it's also making it tangible. Like, as, as you say, like it's an, a real dollar that you will need to pay. So that's yeah. definitely changing all the equation if you start assigning the, the real value of it. So um, I got a question, probably one of the last ones. We have so many questions. So probably we can share those afterwards with you if you are curious about that. And sorry, we're not going to get to all of those. Um, Kevin Power, uh, one of our CTAs, is asking a question about how have you seen customers me measuring success? Is it something that you have been ever been involved to with? Have you have any conversation on that? Um, because it's like you're providing very insightful information about how to drive decisions, but what happens next? Yeah, generally companies have some sort of uh, key performance indicator um, that they're trying to hold against. There's typically some sort of year over year reduction of emissions that they're hoping to see or year over year reduction of emission intensity, which is the emissions for the production of a given kilogram of a good. So a little bit more of a direct relationship as well as then cost of goods sold. And so, for us, those are the typically the two KPIs that we're focused on. It's like, what is the reduction of emission intensity year over year? And then the cost. And, and those are kind of like the hard number points. And then I'd say like the, the last part that we like to be able to work with customers on to like measure success is like, can you build a good story off of it? Clearly part of the sustainability journey is being able to be proud about you being more green and improving the world and being able to provide that story to others. So when we look at was a you know, a, a service successful was an action or reduction initiative successful was what is that year over year change from emissions perspective? What was the cost implications where they were, what they thought they were going to be? Um, and then is this something that you, you're proud to incorporate and discuss from like a marketing perspective? Awesome. Thank you for that. I love the idea of trying to tell, you know, telling stories with data is always a, always a challenge, but I think it's a unique skill and something we need to do better. It makes it more accessible and kind of can bring that message beyond just a marketing perspective and kind of can bring some of that impact, you know, expand the scope of the impact, if you will, um, and, and bring it more, make it more accessible. Um, so with that, maybe we'll take a look at our, our poll results here. Thank you for participating in our final poll. The question was, what was the most interesting part of today's um, session for you? I'm just looking at the the results here. It looks like kind of the two or the top picks are understanding how to use AI to gain insights in real life, and so that's awesome. I know AI is definitely a hot topic, where there's a lot of different applications and a lot of a, a lot of complexity there with AI, and so it's great to to see that and then gain new perspective on sustainability challenges and some of the just tools to overcome these. And so I don't know if Harris, if you have any thoughts about our poll results there. No, I, I I'm glad that. that this is what we're seeing. Like, uh, I think very much our focus today was like, where are those technology applications and how can they help make more sustainable supply chains? So I think, you know, Kelmore was a, a success from that perspective, but um, I'm glad to see it. Awesome. So uh, you have created a lot of new passionate members of our society about sustainability, and you've brought a lot of insights on hey, probably technology can make a difference here. This can be a game changer or even adjust your mindset uh, towards making better decisions or more informed decisions. Um, so is there any final words you want to share with, with your with our audience here today as we wrap it up? Um, thank you very much for everybody for your time and, and giving me the opportunity to talk. Uh, you know, Maybe again, leaning into the discussion that we had about halfway through, Laura, I, I think that everybody... Uh, every professional can have a sustainability impact and you know because you're interested in the space and you're thinking about it I, I think that's amazing and as you continue on with your growth like find those opportunities to have an impact within your company awesome yeah but definitely thank you for joining us today Harris we appreciate your time and sharing the insights and the discussion um, with us today and thank you everyone in our audience for participating today in our polls but as well as all the um, questions in the Q&A, there's tons of questions still remaining. And so we'll, we'll maybe we'll share those with you, Harris, af offline afterwards, and you can take a look. But thank you all for your participation today. And Laura, it's always a, a pleasure to co-host with you. Um, thank you for co-hosting with me today as well.
It's always fun and, and discussions are great with our uh, speakers. So thank you, Harris, for being here today. Thanks, Kelly, and I'm always happy to co-host with you. And to the audience, this is the last webinar of our uh, season with Kellen. So you will now switch gears to the season uh, with, with the other members of our MicroMasters team. So Harris, uh, we've been very proud and very um, grateful to have you as our last speaker on this season. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, everyone, for joining. And see you soon. Good luck. Keep it up. Good luck with the final exams to those who are taking the courses.